Hi, my name is Ray Kimber, and I'd like to present my implementation of the classic ball and beam apparatus for control system experiments. This system controls a ball uh, on a beam, on a track, to make it do certain things like return to the center when disturbed, which is what you see happening now, or move from side to side repeatedly, which I won't be discussing in this video. The system uses a webcam video camera, which you see here, um, and image processing software to, first of all, identify the ball as an object. This is uh, an image of, um, of the live feed from the webcam, and you see it's just pixels, image pixels, and the first task is to identify the ball as an object of interest and then to estimate uh, the center of the ball so that the, uh, this information can be fed to uh, the controller, in this case a simple PID controller, um, uh, to adjust the position of the beam to make the ball do what, what the, the uh, intended purpose is, in this case return to the center. Uh, the actual control, the movement of the beam is controlled by a stepper motor, which you see here behind the ball. Um, and in a few minutes I'll go into more detail about the different components and, uh, and some of the challenges that I had in designing this system. But before I go into the details of the system components and the challenges I faced, I want to point out the accuracy of the system as a whole. It can uh, control the, the ball to within 0 0.04 inches of the target, zero inches, which is represented by uh, the nine inch mark on the ruler. Um, and this has two parts. First of all, uh, the worst case error between the calculated position, uh, which you see here uh, displayed as XD, uh, on the screen in the upper left. Um, the difference between that, the calculated position along the ruler, and the actual uh, measured position along the ruler is roughly 0 0.04 inches. That's, that's a worst case error. Uh, and this was verified in static testing, that is, you know, without the uh, control algorithm running, but just positioning the, uh, the ball at various points and measuring it and um, uh, uh, comparing that with the, uh, the calculated distance. Uh, and so this was verified at um, a zero degree tilt and also a 20 degree tilt uh, for various uh, points along the ruler. Um, secondly, any difference from the, uh, the zero target um, of 0 0.04 inches or less is considered zero. It's considered reaching the target, and uh, the control algorithm at that point stops trying to reduce the error. Um, I set this threshold to 0 0.04 inches as a, a good compromise between uh, steady state accuracy and, um, and settling time. Obviously, the smaller the error threshold, the more um, it would have to continue to hunt uh, to, uh, to reach the target. So uh, I thought that was a good, um, a good uh, compromise. Now it's not always easy for the, the PID controller to, to get to this 0 0.04 inch um, success threshold because of several difficulties. First of all, the beam is, is just a stock aluminum uh, channel you know, just a piece of aluminum channel, um, which doesn't have a high degree of manufacturing uh, precision. Spots where the width is a little more narrow or a little wider represent high or low spots in the ball's path. Um, these width variations could have been due to manufacturing or, or in handling or in uh, the fabrication process. Uh, you know, of, of my apparatus here. 
There's also friction to deal with. Uh, it takes a little jostling to overcome the ball static friction, which you can, you've seen uh, occur here. And once it gets rolling, the low dynamic friction uh, lets it roll pretty easily. So um, it's important to, to stop this uh, momentum before it, it, uh, it results in too much of a departure from the target and just a, a lot of back and forth um, oscillation. Although most of the time the settling is pretty good, uh, there can be times where, um, where it can take 20, 30 seconds for it to just hunt around and jostle till um, you know, till it's finally to within that 0 0.04 inch uh, success threshold. Um, and partly, uh, well, in, in order to overcome that and to, to do some fine tuning, um, within a plus or minus one inch uh, range of the target, um, I, I have a separate set of PID parameters uh, from the uh, the set that handle the large excursions from the the target, um, and this enables uh, the controller to fine tune the control in that region where um, where the ball is moving fairly slowly, and and these different nonlinearities, the friction, the high and low spots along the track, and so forth, where they're they're more pronounced those effects. So. Um, I think the parameters that I have are, are a pretty good uh, set of, of small scale and larger scale PID parameters. Uh, so I'm very satisfied with the, uh, the overall performance. The topics that I'd like to talk about in more detail are major components of the system, an overview of the image processing, calibration of the camera and the apparatus, image distortion correction, mapping the ball center in the image to points along the beam, and the PID controller. Here's a rundown of the major components of the system. The apparatus consists of, first of all, a track, and uh, this is a 12-inch aluminum beam um, it's uh, 1.32 inches wide, the inside uh, width. Uh, the beam along with a motor coupling, which you see here, uh, were purchased from robotshop.com. The checkerboard pattern that you see on the beam is very important. It's the reference plane, also called a world frame, that I use to define a mapping from the points on the camera's image plane to a frame of reference outside of the camera. I'll explain more about how I use this in a few minutes. The ball is two and a half inches in diameter, it's hollow, and it's made of thin, hard plastic. The orange color is to make it easy to distinguish from the background, which is important in the image processing. And this was purchased from a, a dollar store. The motor, which you see here, along with uh, the motor mount that I purchased from uh, robotshop.com. The motor is a NEMA 17 12 volt 0.4 amp four wire bipolar stepper motor. It's rated for 56.6 ounce inches of holding torque and it was purchased from stepperonline.com. Uh, along with the NEMA 17 motor mounts. You see one here I'm using for this riser, um, and here's the other one here that's uh, mounting the motor. A few more comments about the track. Uh, you notice that I have um, a level bolted to the side of it. This allows me to level the track at startup um, before I start controlling it. I, I start with a nice level base, and also the the ruler is just mounted uh, with double sticky tape to the, the top of the, of the level. I'd also like to point out this roll of solder that I'm using essentially as uh, mechanical ballast. There were some unwanted vibrations in the track and um, 
after trying many different approaches, uh, I realized that if I just added some more mass uh, to the track, then um, it would damp down these vibrations. The wooden platform was made from scraps of wood. Miscellaneous hardware included the, uh, the motor mount bracket that's holding the, the vertical support and a C-clamp that's used to hold the, uh, the webcam in place. Um, and you know, just a miscellaneous bracket, a straight bracket. The webcam is a Logitech 922C operating at 30 frames per second generating 640 by 480 pixel frames. The tripod that comes with the webcam has a mounting adapter that I use to mount the camera to the apparatus. Here's the Here's the adapter mounted to this flat bracket and the C-clamp. I use a, um, a TB6600 4 amp 9 to 42 volt stepper motor driver um, which I purchased from, um, from Stepper Online also. I use a Raspberry Pi 3 and an Arduino Uno combination as the processing power for the system. The Raspberry Pi 3 uh, runs um, uh, Linux Raspbian version 9, which is Stretch, and basically has three main uh, uh, tasks. It creates the user interface to control the program. Uh, it receives the raw video frames from the webcam and does all the image processing to detect the ball and calculate its position. And it implements the PID motor control program and sends required position commands to the Arduino via a serial port. The Arduino Uno basically manages the position of the stepper motor, including acceleration and deceleration, in accordance with the Raspberry Pi's position commands. It directly drives the TB6600 stepper motor driver. For those of you interested in software details, here's a summary of the languages and various packages that I used in the project. Most of the projects I've done in the past were written in C on embedded processors, so I was really starting from scratch in everything. Linux, Python, OpenCV, and image processing in general. So I'm very grateful to the many internet authors of the tutorials and examples and references that got me started. The first step in the image processing is to take the raw 640 by 480 pixel images coming from the video camera at 30 frames per second and reduce them to 640 by 240 pixels by cropping. This is done to reduce the matrix sizes and processing time. Here you see the raw frames from the camera cropped to 640 by 240 pixels. Next, each frame is converted from BGR, blue, green, red color, to HSV, hue, saturation value color using an OpenCV color conversion function. This is done because apparently HSV images are easier to filter than BGR. Here's the HSV image. This is the BGR and this is the HSV image. Then the HSV image is filtered to produce a binary image, black and white, using the OpenCV in range function. The filtering works like this. You set maximum and uh, minimum values between 0 and 1 for the H, S, and V components. I set these values with sliders which range from 0 to 255 and then divide by 255 to get my 0 to 1 range. Now here you see some preset values that um, I found work pretty well for the ball color and the lighting conditions in my particular project. For each pixel in the HSV image, 
the H, S, and V components also have a value between 0 and 1. Basically, the filtering asks, for a given pixel, does its H, S, and V values each lie between the maximum and minimums that were set? Yes or no? In the binary image, again shown here, a pixel has a value of 1, white, if the answer is yes. That is, if each of its H, S, V values lie between the maximums and minimums that were set. Otherwise, the pixel has a value of 0, which is black. By adjusting the filter's max and min values, you can ideally isolate the object of interest, in this case the ball, by making only that object white and everything else black. You can see how this filtering works or doesn't work as I change the max and the min values for the various components. Um, the maximum for the H component set to 5. Um, if I increase it much beyond 5, I start introducing a lot of extra noise and you can see that uh, the filtering just breaks down. Um, so I'll put this back to 5. Um, other, it, it, for instance, the maximum in the, uh, the S component set to 256. If I start reducing that, um, it just the the uh, the image just tends to disappear, so I keep that at 256, and so forth. So you can see that a proper filtering is very dependent on the the settings of the uh, the filtering components, and of course you want to uh, you want to make sure the filtering holds. Um, over the range that the uh, the ball will will be uh, um, captured, the images will be captured. So at this point, I have a sequence of images, ideally consisting of a white ball on a black background. Although in practice, there may be other white blobs in the images besides the ball. Um, you saw some of it as I adjusted the HSV uh, filtering uh, values. The task is to distinguish the ball from among the other blobs. If the filtering was effective enough, the ball should be the largest white blob in the image. And by using OpenCV's find contours function, the contours or boundaries are found for a specified number of blobs. Uh, I set it to 50 in my case. It's straightforward from there to find the, the contour, the blob, with the maximum enclosed area, which should be the ball. Finally, the OpenCV moments function calculates the moments of this maximum contour, the ball, and these moments yield the centroid or center of the ball in pixels with a simple calculation. These calculations are performed on each incoming video frame, which is 30 times a second. So the ball's position in pixels is updated each 1 30th of a second. I've already talked about calibrating the HSV filtering there are three more very important calibration steps that need to be performed. Optically calibrating the camera, aligning the camera, and leveling the beam. Optical calibration of the camera means characterizing the distortion, focal length, and other parameters of the Logitech 922C webcam. MATLAB has an excellent utility for doing this, which is what I used. The process consists of presenting a rectangular checkerboard pattern to the camera at 20 or so different distances and orientations. I used this one, which I downloaded from the internet. You just hold it at various distances and orientations to the camera, which is attached to your PC running MATLAB. Uh, you hold it for about a second or so until MATLAB has a chance to, uh, to snap an image of it. Now, the 
squares on the uh, on the, the checkerboard can be any size, but to achieve the best accuracy in your system, they should have a uniformly precise size and you should be able to measure it precisely. MATLAB's camera calibration utility then produces a camera matrix that contains all the projection characteristics, the radial and tangential distortion parameters, and the extrinsic matrix for each of the calibration images. The projection characteristics, focal length, principal point, skew, etc., are all contained in what's called the intrinsic matrix. This was essential data for the calculations to be performed in the Raspberry Pi. I didn't directly use the distortion parameters in how I chose to correct for distortion, but it was essential that MATLAB had them in the camera matrix. I'll talk more about distortion correction in a minute. I said that the calibration utility produces an extrinsic matrix for every checkerboard image. But what exactly is an extrinsic matrix? It's a 4x4 four four matrix consisting of a 3x3 three three rotation matrix R and a 3x1 translation vector T. Together, they map the origin of a world coordinate frame to the camera coordinate reference frame. Now, I didn't need these 20 extrinsic matrices for my project, but what I did need was a single extrinsic matrix that mapped the level checkerboard pattern and its origin on the beam back to the camera reference frame. Creating this extrinsic matrix is pretty straightforward using several of MATLAB's functions, which I've listed here. I'll explain how I use this particular extrinsic matrix in a minute. Getting back to the other two calibration steps, I still have to level the beam and align the camera. And unlike the camera calibration, which you do once for the entire project, uh, these two things uh, should be done every time the system is started in order to ensure the best accuracy. Leveling the beam is pretty straightforward using the attach bubble level. Um, and I also have a function that I use to send uh, single steps to the Arduino, um, either clockwise or counterclockwise until the beam is level. And then when I exit this function, the uh, system step counter is reset to zero. I'll demonstrate this. In the upper left-hand corner, you see the main menu of uh, control options for the entire system. I'll just hit A to go into the Arduino uh, submenu, L for level the track, and you can see that I can uh, enter either a plus or minus um, or a, a number from zero to nine to get multiple steps with each press or, uh, each uh, plus or minus. Plus um, moves the beam clockwise one step minus moves it counterclockwise. So since I'm a little bit uh, too clockwise, um, I'll hit a series of minuses. And you can see the beam start to shift and it's starting to come to center. And that looks pretty good right there. Um, it, it's hard to see clearly in the video, but um, in reality, it looks pretty centered. And, and I would go over to the beam and actually make sure it's, it's dead center. Um, so looks pretty good now. And then when I hit Q to exit this function, um, it resets the step counter to zero and I'm ready to go. Also straightforward is aligning the camera properly with respect to the beam and its checkered board pattern and attached ruler. Starting with the level beam and the HSV filter properly set, I use another special function to superimpose a grid pattern over the beam image. Then I physically adjust the camera orientation until the beam is centered and parallel to the grid pattern. 
I'll demonstrate this also. In the video, which unfortunately is not the best quality, I'm still learning video on the iPad, you see a close-up of the beam, the checkerboard pattern, and the roar. When I superimpose the grid on the image, you see that the center of the beam lines up pretty well with this, the center vertical grid line. Um, it also passes through the 9-inch mark on the ruler, so they're, they're good signs of alignment. And if I bring the center of the ball, let's see here, if I bring this up to where its position is at 320 pixels, which is the center. So the center of the ball is now lining up with the center of the, um, of the grid pattern. You can see that the, the ball's physical center, by looking at the, uh, the top curve, lines up uh, both with the center line and also with the, uh, the line that I drew from the 9-inch ruler mark. I extended it upward. So this shows a, a good alignment all ways around. Uh, the ball is physically aligned with the, uh, the grid system and um, the grid system is nicely aligned with the, uh, the center of the uh, checkerboard pattern and the, uh, and the beam. So that's the alignment of the, and calibration of the beam. A few minutes ago, I summarized the image processing on each incoming frame which inevitably has some optical distortion. To correct this distortion, I could have included a step which applied OpenCV's undistort function on each frame using the distortion parameters calculated during MATLAB's camera calibration process. However, this would have increased the required work done in each 1 30th of a second control cycle. Instead, I used another approach which only required a quick correction on the pixel coordinates once the ball is detected and its center has been calculated. Back in MATLAB, I took a static image of the level beam and its checkerboard pattern and used the MATLAB undistort image function to correct for distortion. Part of the output from this function is an X and Y constant pair called new origin which allows you to map corresponding pixels from the undistorted image back to the distorted image and vice versa. So for any point in the original distorted image, say the center of the beam's checkerboard pattern, I can quickly calculate the corresponding pixel in the undistorted image by subtracting new origin from the distorted image point. This correction applies to any distorted image, regardless of the content on the image, for example, a tilted beam. So getting back to the image processing, let's say a distorted video frame depicting the ball on the beam at a certain angle arrives from the camera, and the image processing finds the center coordinates of the ball, as described a few minutes ago. Applying this new origin correction just to the distorted ball's center allows me to derive the undistorted center of the ball without undistorting the entire image. It produces the same result as if I first undistorted the entire image and then found the ball's center. Now I'd like to talk about mapping the center of the ball in the video images to points along the beam. Looking at the diagrams, this includes first mapping the two-dimensional image point of the ball center, XIP, in the image plane in figure 1, to the corresponding three-dimensional world point, X world. Then in figure 2, mapping X world to the corresponding point of contact along the beam, X pause. This must be done for every incoming video frame for arbitrary beam angles. After researching many references on video optics, I found a lot of useful formulas mapping from three-dimensional world points to two-dimensional image points, 
which is a one-to-one -one mapping, but it was very difficult to find a useful mapping from the two-dimensional image plane to the three-dimensional world plane because there are an infinite number of three-dimensional points that map to a given image point. Fortunately, MATLAB has a pair of mapping functions, points to world and world to image, which are in the form of scripts as part of the computer vision system toolbox. I was able to adapt parts of the points to world function to provide me with the point of intersection between a given image points ray and any reference plane of my choosing. In this case, the reference plane was the checkerboard pattern mounted on the beam when the beam is level. This point of intersection is, of course, X world. So for any image point of the ball center in pixels, I could calculate a corresponding XY world point on the checkerboard reference plane when it was level. This XY world point is measured with respect to the checkerboard plane's origin, which is near the left edge of the beam or on the right uh, side of the beam in the diagram. Uh, just a note um, about detail here. Uh, th this topic is very detailed and my intent here is to just give you an overview of the kinds of calculations that are needed to do these mappings. If you want more detail, I've included two detailed slides after the, the, uh, the diagrams. Uh, feel free to fast forward or stop and read those uh, as you wish. Now to go from this level checkerboard reference plane to a reference plane at any tilt angle, I define three 4x4 four four homogeneous matrix transformations. Uh, these are used in extensively in robotics kinematics analysis. Referring to figure three, the first transformation was for a translation from the checkerboard reference frame origin OW to the center of the stepper motor shaft OM. The second was for a rotation of the motor shaft for an arbitrary angle theta. The third was another translation from the motor shaft to the center of the checkerboard pattern OC just above it. Inserting the R matrix and T vector that I derived for the checkerboard, the level checkerboard, into a 4x4 four four transformation matrix and post multiplying it by the three transformation matrices in the sequence given above yields a composite 4x4 four four transformation matrix and therefore a composite R and T which maps the origin OC and orientation of the beam's checkerboard plane for any angle theta to the camera's reference frame. Using the R and T from this composite 4x4 four four matrix in my version of the points to world function allows any image point in pixels to be mapped to the corresponding point X world on the tilted checkerboard plane. Referring to figure two, this means that if the image point is the center of the ball and the point X world is where the ray from the ball's center intersects the tilted checkerboard plane, X world can now be calculated. Also, the angle alpha that this ray makes with the checkerboard plane can be calculated. The final step is to calculate, using this intersection point and angle, the corresponding position along the beam as measured by the ruler. This can easily be done by a geometric analysis using the dimensions of the beam and ball as shown in figure two. In my testing, the accuracy of the calculated distance along the ruler compared to the actual distance was very good. For a zero degree tilt of the beam, that is level, the worst case error was roughly 0 0.04 inches and the mean absolute error was 0 0.024 inches. For a 20 degree tilt, the worst case error was roughly 0 0.05 inches and the mean absolute error was 0 0.035 inches. 
I didn't anticipate angles greater than 20 degrees or so, and this assumption was shown to be correct in practice. The PID controller was pretty straightforward. It was a Python-based package from the Python Software Foundation called Simple PID. The set point is 0, 0.0 and the controlled variable is x sub p. The PID program calculates the derivative and the integral of x sub p uh, needed for the full PID algorithm. So you just have to supply uh, the x sub p for each control interval. So each 1 30th of a second, a new x sub p is fed into the PID function, which then calculates a required number of steps as a proxy for a required angle of the beam. This required step count is then sent directly to the Arduino, which uh, implements that particular required angle. Um, the PID controller, in essence, is continuously calculating a beam angle um, that it thinks will bring the ball to a stop at zero based on its position, speed, and accumulated error. Um, the PID parameters are listed on the slide. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, there were separate sets of parameters for large excursions, which is uh, greater than uh, plus or minus one, um, and a set for small excursions, which is less than uh, plus or minus one. Well, that's my presentation. Thank you for watching. I hope it was informative, especially if you're thinking about designing your own ball and beam apparatus. Using a video camera to track the ball's position was certainly not the easiest approach, but for me, it was the most fascinating and ultimately the most satisfying approach.